Genocide's been a passion of mine uh, for a long time, but when I started working here, I was thinking of how could I connect um, my passion in genocide uh, education and dehumanization uh, to art. And I borrowed a book from Neely about two years ago, and I still have it. I love it that much. Um, and when we look at, at art, this, this special place, right? We're looking at the, the physical place, uh, the, the social meaning behind it, as well as whatever the artistic creation is going to be. We could look at something like this, and, and, and is that a special place? Well, clearly not. But the same location, literally called Mount Trashmore in Virginia Beach, Virginia, they, they took space and transformed it and gave it special meaning. We look at the difference between authentic space and inauthentic space or, or off-site locations. Uh, the Battle of Midway, not even there at the stone, right, but in the ocean off the coast of the islands, none of us are going to Midway. So while the, the stone by itself memorializes something in almost authentic locations, we have to build something bigger and grander in DC when we want to remember something that's, that's being remembered in inauthentic space. None of us are going to the moon. Okay, so, so if, it, yes, if we, were, if we were on the moon, the footprint itself is authentic space that gives it meaning, but it's not accessible. And so, we have to create other memorials. A simple grave. You guys wanted this to be interactive. Whose grave is that? Could be anybody's, right? A, a simple grave. Could be anybody's. It's authentic space. That's their grave. It's a little bit more obnoxious, but still, does anybody know? Lincoln. Lincoln. Very good, Dr. Mack. That's why he has a PhD. <laughs> How about this one? <laughs> so again, with the authentic space, you're, you're, we're not going to the moon, so we have to build something like this to, to give it glory and grandeur to give it meaning. So when we look again at these simple graves, this na 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 becomes this. This na 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 becomes this. This, way to ruin it, Dr. Mack, na 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 becomes this. And finally, this simple grave becomes this. All four of those memorials are in Washington, D.C. That's not the authentic space. It's not the graves of the presidents. And so they're built bigger, gaudier, more, more detail. Okay. And so when I started applying my interest in genocide to uh, art, and I started looking at the genocide memorials in a different way, one of the things I was thinking about is, again, this, this, this uh, authentic space versus memorialization. Um, I'm not from Delaware. Um, and, but all up and down the East Coast, there's all these signs everywhere. Washington, you know, had a bloody nose here. Washington wiped his, you know, uh, his boo-boo here. The Washington, you know, went to the bathroom here. Like, you know, Washington slept here and all this. These are all authentic spaces, uh, unlike places in Colorado because you guys didn't exist back then. There's this issue of accessibility to space. In Armenia, the Armenian Genocide, the first of the modern genocides, the, the genocide occurred in what we would call Turkey today. The Armenians don't have access to the land where the genocide happened, and so this rump state of, of new Armenia in the northeast here, they wanted to memorialize, memorialize the genocide that the Turks have been denying for over 100 years. They have an eternal flame not just the simple land where the, the blood soaked into the sands of Turkey, but they had to come up with something artistic, abstract, um, it, later pieces I'm gonna show you um, more representative art. The German genocides, the Poles, the Jews, the physically and mentally handicapped, the, the Roma people. If you go to Auschwitz, this is Auschwitz II, I believe. Um, if you go to Auschwitz, you don't need art. If that's the spot where it happened. This is in uh, the Ukraine. 5,000 people were murdered in that hole. They were marched down the streets naked and then machine gunned down. 
You don't need art. That's the spot. The Homo Monument in Amsterdam is an interesting piece of art. It's dedicated to the homosexuals that were murdered by the Nazi regime who were usually murdered in camps. But this art, they decided to take the, the triangle, the pink triangle, and put it downtown in Amsterdam to make it more accessible. So instead of being on the spot where gay and lesbian uh, people were murdered for their sexual orientation, bringing it into the city and then making it more of an artistic representation than the, than the authentic spot. Here in the United States, this is in San Francisco, um, we're get, becoming even more representative, right? The, the, to, to have the fence, to have the barbed wire, to have human beings lying down on the ground. This is probably the most complicated genocide memorial that I've, I'm aware of. This is in Miami. This is the Miami Holocaust Memorial. This outstretched ham, hand reaching for life, freedom, and all along it, spiraling around it, people in pain. You don't need this in Germany or Poland because it's the authentic space. In Miami, you need this to, to conjure the emotion. In Cambodia, Shelby uh, has been there, Dasha has been there, they know it better than I, I haven't been here yet. This is the S-22 prison. You know that this is the spot where people were tortured and murdered. Their faces, they don't, you don't need art, just simple pictures or the rooms where you see the blood stains still there. The Balkan genocide, a stone with a number and a dot, 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 because will we ever really know how many there were? graveyard. You don't need something representative when you know that's the spot that the, the bodies are, ra are laying in. And Rwanda, probably one of the most um, real, they, 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 in the Cambodian, um, one of the Cambodian memorials as well as throughout Rwanda, the three major Rwanda memorials, they literally have the skulls of the human beings that were murdered. You can see the machete marks in the, in the bone, the cracked skulls. Um, one of the other churches, because a lot of the, the um, two of the three memorials are inside Catholic churches that where the Tutsis had hidden and then were murdered anyways, they actually have the clothing uh, that the people wore it still has the blood stains on them hanging, and they ha have the clothing and jewelry hanging from the ceiling in the church. Which got me thinking about the Native American experience, whether you consider it genocide or not. Native Americans don't have access to the land where their people were murdered, much like the Armenians and the, and the Turks. Right here in Colorado, the Sand Creek Battle, Sand Creek Massacre, two different ways of looking at the same thing. Down there in southeastern Colorado, they have two memorials. They have a stone that says battleground, and then they have a stone that says massacre site. And right now, as we're here presenting, there's the Rohingya genocide going on. How is that going to be remembered? We don't know. Is Burma going to admit to it? Or is it going to become another Native American genocide, another Armenian genocide, denied, denied, denied? I am teaching. I'm plugging my own class here. I'm teaching a class uh, next term, if you're interested and available. Um, but it's my great honor to, to invite you after um, Matt's presentation. Uh, one of my students did a two-channel video diptych, see how I, I'm learning all this lexicon, um, and it's a, about a seven minute video about how history is portrayed, um, great man theory versus uh, history from below, and so we'll be showing that in Triborough 102 at 2.35 this afternoon, so please join me if you can. Thank you very much. I feel like I have serious questions in my uh, discussing my artwork, but it will not be anywhere as serious as Tom's. So I sort of like my, my concerns and problems are a lot smaller, I guess. Um, but, so um, this is the second uh, lecture that I've given in the faculty focus uh, lecture series. And so um, 
instead of showing you a breadth of my work, I'm going to focus on a single piece um, and talk to you about the ideation as well as the fabrication of that piece. Um, so this is a sculpture that I completed over the summer. It's titled The Blind Leading the Blind, and it was for a Black Cube exhibition. For any of you that don't know uh, what Black Cube is, it's a, um, it's a nonprofit art organization uh, here in Denver run by Courtney Stell. And they put on um, fantastic exhibitions, often in non-traditional art spaces. So I'd highly encourage you to check them out if you haven't heard of them before. Um, in this particular exhibition uh, that I was invited to participate in um, was asking the artists to explore their relationships uh, with cars or transportation. And so our, each artist was encouraged to use either their car or a bar borrowed car in their artwork. And the exhibition itself was in a two-story uh, two garage, parking garage. This is the top story, which was just open air. And there was maybe about six artists up there. And then the, um, the bottom story had about five artists below. And so when I first got this invitation and was thinking about my relationship to a car, um, I feel like this picture <laughs> sums that up pretty well. Um, I'm, I, f I feel like I'm a reluctant owner of a car. Uh, our city and our Western society, uh, in order to participate and be an active member, um, for the most part, we are all required to own cars. Um, and I am part of that as well. And But I wanted to sort of like think about that more in this exhibition. Um, and it got me reflecting about a, a, t a period when I did not own a car. When I first moved to Colorado, uh, I lived in Boulder and w went to the graduate program there. And I specifically chose um, to live close to campus and not own a car and only use a bike as transportation. And it was, it was certainly a transition. Um, you know, like I had to take my bike to go grocery shopping, any sort of shopping um, and all that kind of stuff as well as all weather um, throughout the year. But I actually grew to love it. Um, it was sort of at the end of the day to have that physical time um, to process the day um, and to have there be um, uh, like 30 minutes before I get home to kind of unwind from the day. Um, I, I grew to really enjoy that. Now I still have 30 minutes to get to my house, but it's in a car and there's traffic and it's stressful and I'm not like um, sort of unwound by the time that I get home, I'm more wound up. So this was um, the proposal that I first sent to Courtney when we were discussing this piece. And so um, there's a couple things going on in this image and I'll kind of unpack it throughout the talk here. But so um, I, I, so the, you'll, you'll notice, so there's a, the statue itself is a, it's a 20th century uh, figure sculpture by Rodin, which I will talk about more as an influence on my artwork. Um, the figure's wearing underwear and a blindfold. Uh, the, the underwear is meant to, so like statues, um, you could talk about them as either being naked or nude. Um, so like a nude statue is a common, like most figurative statues are nude and we sort of accept that. But if it's naked, that's a different feeling. And so by putting the underwear on it to me is exposing um, the vulnerability of the fact that I'm idealizing the idea of not owning a car, yet I own a car and rely on it every single day. And then the blindfold is um, referencing both the title as well as the idea that I'm fully aware of the problem, but I'm choosing not to change it and choosing really not to see it. Um, so the blind leading the blind is actually um, a parable from the New Testament, and um, it has been depicted in art uh, throughout the times. This is a particular painting by Bruegel, um, 16th century. Um, and while the parable is talking more about mental blindness rather than like a actual physical ailment of not being able to physically see. Um, so Bruegel is depicting it um, literally, but this sort of it, he's alluding to different ideas about this parable. And while researching this project, one thing that I found uh, discovered about this painting that I think was interesting to me was that so obviously I didn't recognize these sort of like clothing items here, but um, historically these figures are actually of a high class. So they sort of have like clean white stockings, they have shoes, they have uh, like these sort of capes, and then they also have like coin purses. So these are actually, they're, they're not like poor peasants. They are, are rich, um, upper class. 
and they are just sort of following each other blindly and falling into this ditch here, basically. And so I kind of think of it as this idea that we're all kind of going after different things, sort of some of what Rob was talking about, that sort of this, the, these statuses of either power or money. Um, and, and sometimes we get trapped in our sort of societal um, constructs and, and follow those ideas as if they are the highest of what we want to reach rather than really thinking them through. Um, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's kind of interesting. Um, so thinking about cars and technology, so it's become a common occurrence that people are literally driving into lakes um, because they're just following their GPS blindly. Their GPS tells them to turn and then they turn onto a dock and then they keep driving and then they decide to get out of the car when the water's starting to come in. So um, I think that in our current place or time in, right now in culture, I really feel that we are looking towards technology to save us and to answer all of our problems. And I think um, while I, I'm a full subscriber to technology and in, in all the ways that we all are, I think it's important to think about how it affects us and not to just like readily accept that it is always going to give us the answer to our questions. So going back to the proposal, um, I, I see a car as a tool and a piece of technology. And I find that by the very fact of owning a car, the idea of walking or biking becomes inconvenient. In this particular picture of the original proposal, just as a side note, the figures behind the car as if the car is in control, we ultimately decided to put the figure in the front because we recognize that there are, like, there are moments in American history where there was violence that occurred with dragging people behind cars, and we just didn't want that to be a part of the conversation. So we placed the figure in the front, and I felt like that still worked because um, I have a I have a desire to slow my life down. I feel that like our speed of life is constantly accelerating due to technology in, in ways. And I desire to walk more often, but in reality I don't because I have a car. And so that's how the sort of figure still works in the front. Now I'm gonna sort of shift and, and talk about the figure itself. And the, so that actually came off of a, uh, this spring, I went on a trip to Paris uh, to Rodin's, uh, it's now a museum, but was his uh, studio. And so this is the grounds of the studio. It used to be a state building, but he convinced the state to let him use it as a studio if he gifted all of his works to become property of, this, of the state. It's an amazing building. But all throughout the gardens are, are all of his major works cast in bronze, and then inside are carved uh, marble and plaster pieces. And one thing that was really exciting for me is a lot of times at museums you only see the finished work. This had just tons of evidence of all the different casts he was making um, and combining them in different shapes and things like that. For any of those who've been in my Sculpture One class, there's like waste mold galore happening in there. But it is a, a beautiful building. It's been fully renovated and it just was really special for me to get to witness his pieces in person. You'll see on this side over here, so that's, uh, he, he made many versions and many models of his pieces, and so that's like the thinker, like one of his most famous pieces there. Um, but as a, as a model, not as, as the fully full cast piece. One piece that uh, struck me the strongest while I was there, particularly for its effect to communicate emotional content in the posture of a figure, was this piece right here. It's called the Burgers de Cali. Cali is a French city and Berger would be like the sort of the town leader. And I'm, I won't go into the full background, but essentially the British invaded um, and the King of England said that he would spare the cities, the lives of all the inhabitants if the um, town leaders turned over the keys to the city as well as turned over their lives. So at, um, they eventually, the, the King spared them, but at this moment that's depicted, they're basically um, walking to, to their death. Um, and just a sense of sort of like resignation and remorse in that center figure um, really felt pretty powerful. Um, as a side note, I fully understand that me choosing to drive or not drive has no sense of like self-sacrifice um, as that figure. But, um, but the, it, the, the, the sense of, of communication of, of emotion being communicated in a body of a sculpture was really interested, interesting to me. Um, so he did multiple versions of it, and this is um, the singular figure. And getting into the fabrication of, of this piece, uh, anytime I'm doing a big sculpture, I often will make a smaller version. So it was going to be a six-foot tall figure. This is a two-foot mock-up originally. 
And then I sort of just bulked it out uh, with some materials to get an idea of the general shape of things. And then so this is me laying out all the pieces, uh, sort of representing different bones or landmarks in the body. And I had printed off a, a full scale sketch of a body in order to try to like make sure that I had those proportions correct. Um, the final image that I create isn't necessarily 100% realistic or representational. But for me, when making figurative work, it's important that the actual armature and skeletal structural is still, still real. I feel that the body has a greater sense of presence in the end um, when I do that. So you'll see here, um, I have like the, the sort of maquette and then the piece in the back. And actually, I probably spent the longest time determining the position of the armature. So you can see like there's these sort of white marks in between the bones so that it has been locked into place with plaster at that point. Um, but making it sure I get it into the right position is extremely important because there's really no going back after that. Um, another thing is um, working from the ground up. I specifically don't put a lot of weight on the top of the figure because it all needs to be supported by below. So for the base and the legs um, are majority uh, plaster for the, for the mass. And then as it moves up, I'm using newspaper and uh, simply tape, like masking tape, to kind of bulk out some of the form. Then when I get it pretty close, um, I actually uh, coat it in like a spray insulation foam. And it's just, uh, I don't use the foam for the whole part because it would be hard to build up. It would sort of like, um, while it's wet, it can't support a lot of its own volume. So it's just like a two inch coating across the whole thing. But this material is easy to cut and shave and shape and to help refine it into the, the further last stages of the shape. And then lastly, um, so the whole thing gets covered in plaster as a shell. And then I um, add detail uh, with a commercial, essentially like a paper mache clay. Then I get into uh, the surfacing and the painting of it. Um, just for time's sake, I'm not gonna sort of go into the decisions with the colors, but if you guys wanna talk about that afterwards, I'd be more than happy to. And then this is um, my sort of makeshift transportation. Um, I thought this would be interesting to sort of show to students that um, you know, a fair amount of work and effort is, is involved in actually transporting the work. So um, I wanted to be able to tip it over onto its back in order to get it into a truck. Um, and I didn't want the, the ankles to be stressed at that point. So um, just foam behind it, and they're all numbered, so when this gets taken apart, it can all get um, stacked back together efficiently, and it's all strapped down. And then uh, this is uh, that same shot at the exhibition, and I'll run through a couple images of the work in its finished state. It's kind of a funny story about the underwear. I had to uh, cut it on the sides and then like uh, iron it and, hot and uh, stitch it and then kind of glue it around it because I couldn't really like, put it over its legs because its legs were, and so this was like the day before the exhibition and obviously like I'm stressed out and tired. And so I, I got it and I was like, ah, oh, it looks good, I like it. And then, but when I had done it, I had twisted it. So like a diaper, like if, like, if it was going around and like somehow the back got twisted. So like it was like this big bunch and twist under there, so I had to cut it off and redo it, but <laughs> good times. Um, but so that's my last slide, um, and I'm excited and look forward to questions that you guys might have afterwards, but I believe that we're doing that a little more informally than, than on the stage. So thank you guys.